John Wayne Gacy killed 33 young men and boys that we know of over a period of about six years. But how did he get away with this for so long? In the 1970s, Chicago had a high crime rate, and the police had their hands full. In those days, missing kids were generally viewed by the police as being runaways. Add to that the prevailing attitude of the 1970s concerning gay men, drifters, and kids with arrest records. These types of cases were often shoved to the back of the line. In Chicago, Gacy founded a successful construction business, PDM, attended church, remarried, and volunteered as the Democratic precinct captain in his area. He was a respected and admired pillar of the community, admired by friends, neighbors, as well as the police. In 1972, when boys in the area began vanishing, few looked in his direction. Gacy had a gift for targeting kids that were down on their luck, on the verge of poverty and looking for better lives. Some were trying to get away from home, where there was alcoholism or physical abuse. Then, here comes John Wayne Gacy, an upstanding businessman who's going to help them out. Gacy didn't have to groom them. They were already set up for him by circumstance. Gacy had been part of the victims' lives for as long as several weeks or months before they were murdered. Along with the boys knew Gacy and worked for him because he paid them really well, nearly twice of what they could get in other jobs. Some of the victims were involved in sex work, which is how they came into contact with him. Some were chance encounters. Unfortunately, the police never looked into him as thoroughly as they should have, in spite of all the phone calls from relatives and complaints from some of the victims. Here are the stories of the victims of John Wayne Gacy, young men and boys whose lives were cut short by an evil man. Young men and boys where the prejudices and systematic failure of law enforcement of the 1970s failed them. Tim McCoy was John Gacy's first known murder victim. He was murdered on January the 3rd, 1972, but wasn't identified until May the 9th, 1986. Prior to the 16-year-old's identification, he was known as the Greyhound Busboy. Tim was born in Council Bluffs, Iowa, the son of Jack McCoy and Norma Study. Originally from Tennessee, Jack had been given away twice as a baby and at 17 joined the Navy. After getting discharged, Jack met and married Norma Study, known as Susie in Bartlett, Iowa, a small community near the Iowa-Nebraska border. Tim's father, a musician, was in a band called the Country Rebels. During the day, Jack worked in the fields and in the surrounding factories in the area, while at night, he played his music at local bars. Tim had two sisters, Cindy and Linda, and a younger brother named Terry. He had a typical family life growing up with Boy Scouts, baseball games, Sunday dinners, and assigned chores. At the time, Bartlett was a railroad town, and Tim's grandfather, Bain Study, was a former railroad worker who ran the Bartlett General Store, post office, grain elevator, a one-pump gas station, and local bar named the Honker Inn. Jack McCoy eventually relocated the family to California for the music business, but were forced to return to Iowa when Linda developed lung problems, exacerbated by the smog. However, it wasn't long before Jack relocated the family again, this time to Florida. Jack and Susie's marriage started to break down, and by the start of the 1970s, Tim's parents decided to divorce. By this time, Cindy and Linda had moved out of the house, and Terry moved in with his mom. Tim couldn't stand his mother's new husband and moved to Omaha with Jack. Back in Nebraska... Tim dropped out of school and, being only 15, used a fake ID to get a job as a forklift operator in nearby Council Bluffs, Iowa. With his sisters and younger brothers still in Florida, Tim saw his siblings less and less often. Tim had cousins in different parts of the country and would hitchhike to visit them, 
a pretty common practice in the 1970s. With his cousins, he would go fishing and generally just enjoy being a kid. One of his cousins, Jeff Billings, remembered him as a guy that was always making people laugh. During Christmas of 1971, McCoy's cousin Jeff, Jeff's sister Beverly, and some of the other Michigan relatives decided to visit him and his family in Iowa. McCoy's Aunt Honey and Aunt Tiny cooked while the cousins rode horses. Aunt Tiny had a big house in Glenwood, Iowa, where all the family members bunked five or six to a room. Tim, along with one of his cousins, then decided to visit the rest of their family in Michigan. There, they spent the holidays, taking part in snowball fights, playing pool in the basement, and watching late-night movies. Tim received a Christmas gift of a belt buckle with the symbol of a Model A car on it from his cousin Beverly. After ringing in the new year, the Billings family dropped him off at the Lansing Greyhound bus station to return to Aunt Tiny's house. The bus had a layover in Chicago on the way to Glenwood. Tim promised to call the Billings when he got there. They all hugged him and told him they loved him. That was the last time any of his relatives would ever hear from him. The last photo of Timothy McCoy shows him at the Billings house in Michigan, wearing his green army coat. Tim arrived in Chicago a little after midnight, January of 1972. His layover was until noon the next day. Then the next bus would leave for Glenwood, Iowa. At the time, John Gacy was celebrating the holidays with his mother and her family. Divorced, depressed, living in a house with his mother, and working as a short-order cook, 29-year-old Gacy escaped the festivities. For whatever reason, he ended up at the Greyhound station, where he saw Tim and offered to give him a tour of the city during his layover. Gacy took Tim to get something to eat and offered him a place to stay. Gacy said he would take him back to the station in time to catch his bus. Gacy claimed that he woke up in the morning to find Tim standing in his bedroom doorway holding a kitchen knife. He jumped from his bed and McCoy raised both his arms in a gesture of surrender, accidentally cutting Gacy's forearm. Gacy grabbed the knife and stabbed Tim repeatedly in the chest. When Gacy went to the kitchen, he saw that Tim had set the table for breakfast. Tim had walked into Gacy's room to wake him for breakfast while carrying the knife. Gacy buried Tim in his crawl space and later covered his grave with a layer of concrete. In an interview several hours after his arrest, Gacy said, That's when I realized that death was the ultimate thrill. Aunt Tiny showed up at the bus depot, but there was no sign of Tim. As time wore on, Jack hired a private investigator in Chicago to look for him. He'd never been known to run away before, and back home had money in the bank and a job waiting for him. When Gacy was arrested, Tim's relatives in Michigan followed the unfolding events in Chicago. Linda McCoy thought Tim might have been one of the victims, so Aunt Tiny was tasked with collecting Tim's dental records to send to Chicago PD. However, as time passed and no news came, the family lost hope. Tim remained unidentified until May the 9th, 1986, 14 years after his death. Tim's cousin, Beverly Billings, had been reading a magazine about the Gacy case. She was startled to see that his first victim was known as the Greyhound Bus Boy. Even though Aunt Tiny said she had sent Tim's dental records, the family was sure there had been some mistake. They got in touch with Tim Cahill, the author of Buried Dreams, a book on Gacy. During the interview, Cahill became interested in a belt buckle with a Model T Ford on it that Beverly mentioned. This belt buckle had been found with Tim's remains. Cahill contacted Chicago broadcast journalist Russ Ewing, and the hunt was on for Tim's dental records which were finally located in Florida and turned over to the Cook County Medical Examiner. It didn't take long for body number nine to be positively identified as Timothy McCoy. After the identification, Tim's siblings, Linda, Terry, and Cindy, 
learned that Aunt Tiny had never sent the records, as she wanted to protect the family from the circumstances of Tim's death. Tim's remains were returned to his family in Glenwood, Iowa, and he was buried at West Lawn Hillcrest Memorial Park in Omaha, Nebraska. His father, Jack, died in 1984, never knowing what had happened to his son. John Butkovich was born September 16, 1956, to Marko Butkovich and Theresia Doslik in Croatia. The family immigrated to the United States and settled in the Chicago area. John attended Lane Technical High School. When he was 16, John was working at a hardware store when John Wayne Gacy offered him a construction job at his company, PDM. Gacy's second wife, Carol, referred to John as a nice kid, and he would have dinner with Gacy, Carol, and her two daughters from a previous marriage several times. Marko Butkovich had almost hired Gacy to do work on a six-flat building that the Butkoviches owned. At another building Marko owned, Gacy helped John decorate an apartment his father had given him. On July 31, 1975, John disappeared, and his 1969 black and gold Dodge was later found abandoned at the intersection of Sheridan and Lawrence in Uptown with his jacket and wallet inside and the keys still in the ignition. He had worked for Gacy for about two years. The day before his disappearance, John had confronted Gacy over outstanding back pay. Searching for his son, Marco called Gacy, who claimed he was happy to help search for his son, but was sorry that John had run away. When questioned by police, Gacy said John and two friends had arrived at his house demanding the overdue pay, but they had reached a compromise and all three had left. The police believed Gacy, but John's parents didn't give up. Over the following three years, John's parents called police more than 100 times, urging them to investigate Gacy further. After a while, the police refused to take any more calls from his parents. A little more disturbing, the police officers investigating the disappearance didn't even bother to check whether Gacy had a prior arrest record. Gacy later admitted to encountering John exiting his car and waved to attract his attention. According to Gacy, John approached him stating, I want to talk to you. Gacy invited him back to his home, supposedly to settle the issue of his overdue wages. Gacy offered John a drink, then conned him into allowing his wrist to be cuffed behind his back. Gacy later confessed to having sat on the kid's chest for a while before he strangled him. He stowed John's body in his garage, intending to bury the body later in the crawl space. When his wife and stepdaughters returned home earlier than expected, Gacy buried John under the concrete floor of the tool room extension of his garage in an empty space where he had intended to dig a drain tile. Butkovich was the second victim to be recovered and was designated body number two. He was identified on December 29, 1978. John Butkovich is interred at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. Gregory Godsick was born on March 23, 1959, in Chicago and grew up in the Norwood Park area with his older sister Eugenia, his dad John, and his mom, also named Eugenia. Seventeen-year-old Greg was a senior at Taft High School and had a girlfriend, Judy Patterson, who was a sophomore at the same school. Greg worked at a construction company called PDM Contractors, doing odd jobs. The money was good and allowed him to buy parts for his 1966 Pontiac Catalina. The man who owned the company, John Gacy, paid twice as much as he was making at his last job. He told his mom how nice Gacy was, that he had given them cokes after they were done working, and that he dressed up as a clown for children's parties. The only time Mrs. Godsick was upset by her son's new job was when he came home late and the family was already sitting down to dinner. 
When she asked him where he had been, Greg told her that he had been digging trenches for some kind of tiles. A little after midnight on December 12, 1976, Greg and Judy were on a date. On the way home, they picked up Judy's mother, and Greg dropped both women off at their place before going home. He would never be seen again. In December of 1978, Mrs. Godsick had been listening to the radio, and the subject was John Wayne Gacy and bodies. Her son had been missing for two years. Greg's Christmas gifts, still wrapped, were stored in another room. Eugenia called a friend of hers whose father was a Chicago homicide detective. He knew nothing about the Gacy case, but he would check. No more than five minutes later, the detective called back. Eugenia, the detective said, it's very serious. There are many bodies. Tell your dentist to be prepared to send Greg's records. John Davis, Godsick's dentist, turned the records over to the sheriff's office the following morning. It wasn't long before detectives were knocking on the door of the Godsick residence. The medical examiner had confirmed on December 23rd, two days before Christmas, that body number four was Greg. Gacy had buried him in the same trenches that Gacy had Godsick dig for him and was one of the first victims discovered in the crawl space of Gacy's home. The Godsicks received the remains of their son after the conclusion of the trial so that he could be buried. The Godsick family, Greg's friends, his girlfriend Judy Patterson, and her family attended Greg's funeral. Afterwards, they all met at a local restaurant to reminisce about Greg. Greg's parents, John and Eugenia, pushed hard for Gacy's execution, but because of multiple appeals, they would never live to see it. John would die of emphysema in 1984 and Eugenia in 1989 of breast cancer. Greg Godsick and his parents are buried at St. Adelbert Catholic Cemetery in Niles, Illinois. Richard and Rosemarie Zick lived in the West Town area of Chicago, along with their four sons and one daughter. Richard was a truck driver, and Rosemarie worked the night shift at a bank and taught Sunday school. Growing up, their son John worked a paper route, and his sister Patty often tagged along. He loved animals and often brought them home and was active in Cub Scouts and went to summer camp. John and his brothers were altar boys at St. Stanislaus Koska Church on Evergreen Avenue near the I-90. When the 1970s rolled around, the Zicks found that their neighborhood was changing around them and not for the better. Their neighbors were moving away, and before long, the Zicks moved to Des Plaines, and John would transfer from Gordon Tech High School and start his junior year at Maine West High School. In Des Plaines, the Zick family found a slower pace of life as well as a lower crime rate than in their old neighborhood. John made friends quickly and got a job at Animal Kingdom, a pet shop in the area. At school, he joined the bowling team and the film club. His friends don't remember him smoking a joint or ever having a drink. In his senior year, he purchased a class ring with his initials engraved on the inside band. This ring would be instrumental in connecting Zick with John Gacy. With prom approaching, John asked his friend Lynn Meadows to go to the prom with him. Lynn, for her part, was only interested in John as a friend, and she knew he wasn't interested in her either. John had known for some time that he preferred guys, and Lynn kept his secret. John had a few gay friends. One of them, Mark Johnson, performed in drag as Marcia at a disco called the Bistro, known as the Studio 54 of Chicago. After high school, John got a job at Sargent & Lundy, an energy company in downtown Chicago. After a time, Mark moved out to the suburbs with his partner, and they lost touch. John's friend, Lynn Meadows, remembered Zick telling her about a man named John who promised to give him a job. Zick told Lynn that John had a lot of money and promised to take him to Florida. Getting a bad feeling about all this, Lynn begged him not to go with Florida John. That was the last time she saw him. On January 20, 1977, 
Gacy lured 19-year-old John Zick to his house on the pretext of buying his Plymouth satellite. Gacy later confessed to strangling him in his spare bedroom and burying Zick's body in the crawl space under his house. Gacy later sold the Plymouth satellite to 18-year-old Michael Rossi, a PDM employee, for $300. The following month, Rossi was arrested for stealing gasoline while driving the car. The gas station attendant noted a license plate and police traced the car to Gacy's house. When questioned, Gacy told officers that Zick had sold the car to him in February, saying he needed the money to leave town. A check of the VIN confirmed the car had belonged to Zick. The police didn't pursue the matter further, although they did inform Zick's mother that her son had sold his car. Zick's parents were upset over what they perceived to be either a lack of interest or the incompetence of the police. They paid a month's rent on John's apartment until the end of February 1977. When he didn't return, they moved his things out. On New Year's Day, when the family was getting ready to go to an aunt's house, a car pulled up in front of their house. Even though it was unmarked, they knew it was the police. The officers confirmed to Richard and Rosemary Zick that one of the bodies discovered was that of their son. They had recovered some of John's property, which included a television and a high school class ring at Gacy's home. That class ring, which had his initials, J.A.S. engraved on the inside band, was used as evidence in Gacy's trial. On the Saturday before Easter 1978, the Zick family finally held a funeral for their son, after his remains were released by the police. The funeral was a private family affair, a family that knew him as Johnny. His friends, Mark Johnson and Lynn Meadows, knew him as John, stayed away. John Zick had led two separate lives. John is buried at All Saints Catholic Cemetery and Mausoleum in Des Plaines, Illinois. His parents are buried in the same cemetery. A surprising number of John Gacy's victims came from an area called Uptown on the north side of Chicago. During World War II, the Uptown area was settled by military families. The old homes of the past were split up into sections to provide more space for military personnel who worked at Naval Station Great Lakes, the military's largest naval training station. After World War II, the military families moved out leaving empty residences producing falling housing prices. When timber mills, coal mines, and steel mills began closing down, families from Appalachia emigrated from the area looking for a better life. Down a migration route that was called the Hillbilly Highway, families such as the Reffitts, the Stapletons, and the Kindreds started settling in metropolitan areas like Chicago. The uptown area of Chicago was given the nickname Hillbilly Heaven in the 1960s. Once arriving at uptown, instead of opportunities, many of them were more concerned with survival. Families of various backgrounds were living in closed quarters in housing often run by slumlords. All wasn't dark and depressing, however. Rock bands played at the Aragon Ballroom, the Riviera, the Kinetic Playground, and the Uptown Theater. Uptown was near the beaches of Lake Michigan. It was an area of gangs, drugs, and people generally down on their luck. Daryl Sampson was born on December 6, 1967, in Prince, West Virginia, to Julius Sampson and Dolores Matney. Daryl had a brother, Harold, who died in 1999 at the age of 43 in North Carolina, and a half-brother, Gary Vance, who died in 1994 at age 31 in West Virginia. Daryl had a history of being a runaway in order to avoid court dates over curfew violations in 1973. Dolores Vance was living in West Virginia with her second husband, Kenneth, when her son disappeared. Darrell might have left his West Virginia home to look for work in Chicago, 
Migration to Chicago from Appalachia to look for work was pretty common during the 1970s, with the slowing of the coal industry. Darrell eventually ended up living in an apartment in the uptown section of Chicago and was last seen alive on April 6, 1976. Before his disappearance, he was working in Libertyville, Illinois, at a carpeting company when John Gacy took him to his home under the guise of offering him a construction job. When his mother, Dolores Vance, reported him missing, the police assumed he was a runaway. Mrs. Vance said she called authorities in several states searching for her son and that in Chicago she walked the streets at night looking for him. The 18-year-old's body was the last one exhumed from under Gacy's dining room and had a cloth lodged in his throat. Gacy was remodeling the dining room at the time. Until identification, he was listed as body number 29. Daryl Sampson is buried at Home Oak Cemetery in Lake Villa, Illinois. The Reffitt family was from Lexington, Kentucky, where Randy Reffitt's father, Charlie, an Air Force veteran, was a firefighter. Their mother, Myrtle, made sure the kids attended school and completed their chores, for which they received allowances. Sometimes Charlie would take the kids, Randy, Clyde, Brenda, and Chris, to horse races, as well as the big one, the Kentucky Derby. Things soon took a tragic turn, however. In August of 1969, Charlie took the family to see his mother, Odessa May, known as Nanny. Odessa, an alcoholic, was in an abusive marriage to her second husband, Ray Adams. She opened the door, sporting a black eye, and an argument ensued. Ray, deciding to end the argument, got a thirty-eight and shot Charlie and Myrtle. Both survived, but Myrtle, with a bullet sitting next to her spine, would be in pain for the rest of her life. After getting out of the hospital, Charlie was cared for at home by Myrtle's sister Mabel. Charlie and Mabel began having an affair, and Mabel became pregnant. Needless to say, when Myrtle came home from the hospital, things were pretty tense. Charlie, a drinker anyway, just drank more, and Myrtle started drinking to kill the pain she was in. They stayed together, but Charlie became involved with the seedier side of Lexington and had some questionable associations. He started writing fraudulent checks from which he collected large sums of money. Soon, Charlie left the Lexington Fire Department, and in an effort to start a new life, the family packed up and moved to Uptown. The move from Kentucky to Uptown didn't make things in the Reffitt household any better. Charlie was physically abusive, and Myrtle often fought back. Randy would often try to get between them and would take a beating from his dad for his trouble. It wasn't uncommon for Randy and his brothers to disappear for days to get away from it all. Ten-year-old Randy got into more than a few scrapes and developed a reputation as a tough kid. However, the brothers would always call home to let Myrtle know they were doing okay. In 1974, Randy was walking through an alley behind a food store and was jumped by two guys and was stabbed. Taken to a hospital in serious condition, Randy barely survived. His brother Chris thought this might be initiation for the Latin Kings gang. The x-rays taken at the hospital would prove invaluable in identifying him after his body was recovered from John Wayne Gacy's crawl space. Randy was a good student and even participated in extracurricular activities like softball and Boy Scouts. On May 14, 1976, 15 year old Randy disappeared shortly after returning home from a dental appointment. After touching base with his mom, Randy had gone back out and had run into another uptown kid, Sam Stapleton. Clyde had seen Randy with Sam near their home and noticed the boys had some pills with them. Clyde didn't know whether the boys were going to sell the pills or take them and didn't wait around to find out. Neither Sam or Randy were seen again. After Randy's disappearance, Myrtle partially blamed Clyde for not staying with him, but put most of the blame on her husband, Charlie, for bringing them to Chicago from Kentucky in the first place. 
The police, for their part, treated this as another runaway, using unsubstantiated rumors of Randy sightings to close the missing person's report. Two years after Randy went missing, the final page of his missing person's report read, Due to the fact that the youth is now 17 years old and has been seen, responding officer requests that the case now be closed. On December 25, 1978, the body of Randall Reffitt was removed from the crawl space under John Gacy's house. Dental records were not available to identify Randy, as his dentist had retired and destroyed them. However, there were the x-rays taken of Randy at Weiss Hospital after his stabbing in 1974. These records were sent to Chicago PD. Finally, the knock at the door came, confirming that body number seven was indeed Randall Reffitt. Charles and Myrtle Reffitt attended the Gacy trial every day, and Myrtle took the stand for the prosecution to give the jury a timeline for when she had last seen her son. In the years following Randy's death, the Reffitt marriage continued its downhill slide. Charles and Myrtle finally divorced after 27 years of marriage. Randy Reffitt is interred at Rose Hill Cemetery and Mausoleum in Chicago. His mother Myrtle died in 1994 and is buried in the same cemetery. Sam Stapleton arrived in the uptown section of Chicago with his mom Bessie, younger brothers James and Randy, and stepdad Albert Stapleton when he was around 10 years of age. Bessie Stapleton's father, Frank Dodd, who was born in West Virginia, was a Kentucky coal miner and had moved to Chicago after losing a leg in a coal mining accident. Bessie moved back and forth from Kentucky to Chicago to look for work. Her two older children, Juanita and Sam, were fathered by men she met in Chicago. Bessie gave Juanita the name and a photograph of her father, but never disclosed the identity of Sam's father. Sam either went by the name of Samuel Dodd or Samuel Dodd Stapleton. Bessie's husband, Albert Stapleton, known as Bill, had come from West Virginia and moved to Kentucky after enlisting in the Army during World War II at the age of 17. He was already divorced and the father of three children when he met Bessie. The couple moved around Appalachia with Bessie's children looking for whatever work they could find. Bill and Bessie soon had two children of their own, James and Randy. The family moved around Ohio and settled in Stockton on the Kentucky-Ohio border settling in a small house in a holler up in the woods with dirt floors, no electricity or indoor plumbing. Sam and his siblings would use an outhouse across the road using pages of magazines for toilet paper. The grinding poverty didn't help the Stapleton's marriage, and there were separations and reconciliations. Finally, they moved to the uptown area of Chicago, where Bessie had lived previously to try to expand their options. The move to Uptown didn't affect Sam in a positive way. Kids in the neighborhood picked fights, and at the age of 10, Sam got sucked into the atmosphere of that environment. Conflict arose between Sam and his stepfather, Bill, who had moved the family from Ohio in search of a better life. There were arguments about his fighting and school attendance, and when Sam missed curfew, Bill would go and bring him home, if it wasn't the police doing it. Sam had taken to sniffing glue with his friends, and it was always Bill that pulled him out from under someone's porch to bring him home. It soon became obvious that Sam needed help, and he ended up at a drug rehab center, while Bessie protested stores that gave easy access to glue and other chemicals to minors. After getting out of rehab, 14-year-old Sam Stapleton was looking forward to the fall of 1976 when he would attend Sen High School and was planning on joining the ROTC. His friend Randy Reffitt was finishing his sophomore year at Sen. Sam had recently gotten a job at the Pizza Factory restaurant on Sheridan Road. Things were becoming more promising as a man named John had offered him a construction job that paid really well. John had been calling the house periodically asking for him. 
One day, Sam was visiting his sister Juanita and her new baby. After leaving, he ran into his friend Randy Reffitt on the way home. Reffitt had gone home to check in with his mother and grandmother after a dentist appointment before heading out. Neither of the boys were seen again. Sam was reported missing the next day by his parents. Stapleton was Gacy's youngest victim, and he and Reffitt were buried together in the crawl space. Investigators believe the two boys were murdered the same evening and had gone to Gacy's together. Sam was body number six and the 20th to be identified. He is buried at Rose Hill Cemetery and Mausoleum in Chicago, along with his parents, Albert and Bessie. His friend, Randy Reffitt, is buried a couple of yards away. Billy Kindred lived on Gordon Terrace in the Buena Vista section of Uptown and was sometimes known as Shotgun. You might think that this was because he liked to ride in the passenger seat of a car, but that wouldn't be it. According to his sister Sybil, one night Billy lifted one of his grandfather's shotguns and began shooting out streetlights. After the police arrived, they found 13-year-old Billy hiding under one of the cars. They didn't arrest him, but confiscated the shotguns. They told Billy's grandfather he could have the guns back if he pressed charges. His grandfather refused. Other than appropriating shotguns, Billy and his friend Danny Jockel carried out random pranks around the neighborhood and occupied Uptown's back alleys, sniffing paint and glue to get a cheap high. They also hung out with other kids in front of buildings, loosely formed gangs with such names as the Kenmore Boys and the Ghetto Boys, engaging mostly in the crime of underage drinking. Lola and Kirby Woods and their seven kids lived in an apartment on Gordon Terrace in Uptown. With all those mouths to feed, Lola worked a variety of jobs which included managing buildings, babysitting neighborhood children, and peeling potatoes at restaurants. All the kids were assigned chores and always wore nice clothes. Kirby Woods was Lola's third husband. Billy and Sybil's father, Ira Kindred, Lola's first husband, took off and moved to Florida, so he was not in Billy and Sybil's lives very much. Lola, Kirby, and the kids led difficult lives, and money was in short supply. Billy's favorite song was The Poor Side of Town by Johnny Rivers, and he would play it over and over again, much to the consternation of Sybil. Sometimes the kids would travel to their Uncle Frank's farm in Guilford, Indiana, where they would ride horses. Billy had just entered eighth grade and was a city kid, so naturally he wanted to go back home. His younger brother, 10-year-old Michael, wanted to stay for the summer. Unfortunately, tragedy struck and Michael fell into a pond on the farm and drowned. He was buried in Sunman, Indiana, where another of Lola's sons was buried. After this incident, Lola and Kirby decided to leave Chicago and move to Harrison, Ohio a town on the Ohio and Indiana border. Billy, for his part, didn't remain in Ohio very long. He missed his old life and his friends in Chicago and soon returned to Uptown and at the age of 16 was now on his own. He dropped out of school and started working odd jobs like painting and repairing buildings and spending his free time with friends drinking beer, smoking marijuana, and getting into fights. Billy and his friend Danny had difficulty staying out of trouble. One day, after getting hammered on Southern Comfort, they thought it might be a good idea to try to get money from a gay man and went to his apartment with the suggestion that they were there for sex. After the boys became aggressive, the man told them to leave, and Danny and Billy hit the man over the head, ransacked the apartment, and stole his car. The boys knew they had to get out of town fast. Putting together whatever money they could scrounge up, the boys bought bus tickets, heading west to stay with Danny's brother Mike in Santa Monica. After a while, the boys wore out their welcome and Billy left heading for Florida. Billy made it to Florida, but after arriving, he decided to turn himself in. He and Danny were reunited in front of a judge at the Cook County Courthouse. Billy was sentenced to 90 days in jail and four years of felony probation 
while Danny got 60 days in jail and four years of felony probation. After his release, Billy met Mary Jo Paulus when he and his friend Danny Jockel picked her up in his Chevelle while she was hitchhiking with a friend to a community pool. Billy and Mary Jo started dating, and for the most part, he stayed out of trouble while he was with her. He had moved into an apartment with two other guys on Melrose Avenue and was working a series of side jobs, always being on the lookout for the next one. Billy told Mary Jo that he had made mistakes in his past and that he wished he'd led a better life. In February of 1978, Billy called Mary Jo to give her some good news. He had finally gotten a break. He and his friend Gerald had met a man that worked as a contractor out of his house, and the man was interested in hiring them. He promised he'd be by to see her soon. She never saw him again. Billy was the final victim buried in the crawl space of John Gacy's home. He was tagged as body number 27 and was identified on May 16, 1979, using dental records supplied by his mother. After Billy's identification, his family gathered in Chicago for his funeral. The day after the funeral, his remains were taken back to Indiana. Billy is buried at Little Memory Church Cemetery in Sunman, Indiana, the same cemetery as his brother Michael. Frank Landigan was born on July 5, 1959, in Delaware. His father nicknamed him Dell, referring to Delaware where he was born. The name later morphed into Dale, and that name stuck. Francisco, Dale's father, was originally from the Philippines. After World War II, Landigan was a stowaway on an American service boat, becoming a cook, and arrived in New York in the 1940s. Francisco traveled around, finding work wherever he could get it. He met Dale's mother, Dorothy Lee Brazell, in South Carolina at a car hop. Dorothy was a teenager, maybe 14 or 15 at the time, and became pregnant. Francisco convinced Dorothy's mother, Lucille, to let him marry her and promised to take care of her. He claimed he was only three years older than Dorothy. He wasn't. He was 29. Denise, their second child, was born when Dorothy was 18. The family moved on to Delaware and lived in a mobile home for a while. From Delaware, the family moved to a two-bedroom apartment on Hopkinson Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Crime rates in the area were steadily rising, and Dorothy kept the kids in the house. The Landigan home was a violent one. It wasn't uncommon for Francisco to hit his wife and the violence escalated after the move to Brooklyn. With Francisco struggling to pay the rent, the Landigan family moved in with a relative in Chicago. In 1969, when Dale was 10, the Landigan family, just like in the series Alice, packed up their station wagon and hit the road. Even though the Brooklyn and Uptown neighborhoods economically were similar, the Landigan kids had a lot more freedom in Uptown. All these moves didn't stop Francisco's domestic abuse. On more than one occasion, the violence got so bad that the police had to be called. And the police advice? Take him to civil court. Dorothy spent time in the hospital on several occasions, both for physical as well as mental reasons. That left the kids alone with Francisco, where they endured abuse by him. This was the backdrop in which Dale Landigan grew up and the template for how he learned to treat women. Dale attended Stockton Upper Grade School and then started Sand High School before transferring to Lakeview Academy, an alternative high school that was designed for at-risk students. It wasn't long before Dale stopped attending. Through the Youth Job Corps, Dale got jobs cleaning up parks and at one point worked as an usher at the Uptown Theater. In the meantime, Dorothy had gotten remarried to a man named Al Miller, and Dale moved in with them. Things were beginning to look up for Dale. He had met a contractor who hired him at $5 an hour. Dale continued to have his problems, though. Dale and his father met at a bar and had an argument about 19-year-old Dale's direction in his life. 
Earlier in the day, Dale had been bonded out of jail after being arrested for battery. Showing an amazing lack of self-awareness, Francisco had begged the judge to put Dale in a mental institution. Francisco and Dale left the bar at 3 a.m., walking in different directions. November the 4th, 1978, would be the last time Francisco would ever see his son. On November 12th, Dale Landigan's body was found close to an inlet in the Des Plaines River by two duck hunters. Within 24 hours, Dale was identified by fingerprint records on file, which wasn't too surprising. From interviews with family and friends, investigators found that Dale was prone to violence and dealt in drugs, hustled, pimped, and operated on the fringes of North Side gang activities. Even though he didn't have a job most of the time, he had half a dozen arrests before he disappeared, mostly for battery and auto theft. The bond slip issued to Landigan for his battery arrest was found at Gacy's home. He was victim number 32. Dale is buried at Mary Hill Catholic Cemetery and Mausoleum in Niles, Illinois. William Huey Carroll, known as Billy, was born August the 31st, 1961, in Chicago. Billy's father, William Huey Carroll Sr., was born in Alabama and grew up in Florida, the son of sharecroppers. After World War II, he moved to Chicago, along with many other Southerners looking for a better life. Huey met Chicago native Violet Nagal when he arrived, and they later married. The Carrolls would have three children, Robert, Billy, and daughter Caroline, who was born with severe disabilities. Unable to care for her, Caroline would be placed in a care home. By the time the 1970s rolled around, the Carrolls were living on Huey's Social Security checks. Huey and Violet struggled with alcoholism, and the family lived in poverty. One apartment they lived in had no bathroom, and another had no phone. Billy attended Stockton Upper Grade School in 1973, but was not in love with school, to put it mildly. He often struggled and had trouble reading. He was enrolled in a program called Project Zero, a program for students with learning disabilities. Billy often cut class and was well known to the truant officer. He not only avoided school, but avoided going home as much as possible, and spent much of his time in the streets. Billy had a history of delinquency, once stealing his father's gun to shoot at light poles and at people in order to scare them. Huey recounted an episode where Billy grabbed a woman's purse through the window of the L train. As he grew older, Billy got into fitness and, along with fellow uptown kids Sam Stapleton and Randy Reffitt, could be found at the local YMCA. Huey and Violet pretty much drank Huey's Social Security checks. Bobby Carroll developed a glue-sniffing habit and developed learning and emotional difficulties as a result. Both brothers avoided dealing with their parents' alcoholism by spending their time on the street. Billy had his own enterprise going on out in the streets. He often seemed to have money and would take his friends out for meals. No one really knew how he came up with the money, and when asked, he was pretty vague about it. His friend Gene Anderson finally found out the secret of Billy's mysterious cash flow. One day, Gene went along with Billy to the Yankee Doodle Dandy restaurant on Diversity Avenue. There, Billy would buy some pills and sell them for profit. He was also in contact with men known as chicken hawks, older men in their 30s or 40s interested in boys in their mid-teens. The boys, or chickens, would be picked up on the corner of Clark and Diversity. According to Gene, a kid could hustle, meet a few Johns, do a few tricks, make money, and go home. This was where and how Billy started getting his money. Billy started looking for an escape from all this by going back to school. He and his friend Gene enrolled in the Prologue School, an alternative school founded by Franciscan nuns. Billy never made it out of school. On June 13, 1976, Bobby Carroll turned 19, and Huey, Violet, Bobby, and Billy were all together to celebrate Bobby's birthday. A little before midnight, Billy left the apartment and said he would be back in an hour. 
Looking out the window, Violet saw him get into a car with some friends. She would never see her son again. Violet Carroll spoke to police officers on several occasions after Billy's disappearance. Both Huey and Violet were drinking heavily at that point, and police investigating his disappearance noted the intoxicated condition of the complainant and had to cut an interview short. Huey admitted to police officers that Billy told his parents he was leaving home because of their heavy drinking, and police chalked up Billy's disappearance as being a runaway. When word broke of the John Gacy arrest, Violet and Huey Carroll submitted dental records to Chicago PD. It wasn't long before the police were knocking on their door at their Lawrence Avenue apartment to tell them there had been a positive ID. It was March 17, 1979. He was body number 22 and was buried in Gacy's crawl space. Billy Carroll is buried along with his older brother Bobby and his parents at Mount Glenwood Memorial Gardens in Hickory Hills, Illinois. Nineteen-year-old Matthew Bowman grew up on West Walton Street in Chicago and attended Charles Prosser High School before dropping out and for a short time worked for D. Hill Nursery in West Dundee. His family had been marked by tragedy when in 1975 Matthew's stepfather, Tony Robotuso, was shot during a carjacking while he was waiting to pick up Matthew's mother at the Pulaski L station. Seriously wounded, he stumbled into a liquor store where the manager called an ambulance. Robotuso died at the hospital. Two years later, Matthew was reported missing by his mother, Marie Tortorich. She last saw him after dropping him off at a train station on July 5, 1977, to go to court for a traffic ticket. After he was finished, Matthew phoned his mother to tell her he was heading into the city to visit his sister Laura at her apartment at around 6 p.m. He left Laura's apartment and disappeared. Matthew was found in the crawl space at Gacy's home and was labeled as body number eight. He was positively identified on January 29, 1979. Bowman is buried at St. Joseph Cemetery in River Grove, Illinois. Robert Edward Gilroy was born October 28, 1958 in Chicago to Robert Gilroy and Alice Moriarty. He had two sisters, Kathy and Joyce, and a brother, Joseph, who predeceased him. Eighteen-year-old Bob, a graduate of Taft High School, was last seen alive on September 15, 1977, after he left his uncle Thomas Gilroy's home to go to a horseback riding lesson in Northbrook, followed by attending a camp in Gaithersburg, Maryland. When he didn't show to either the lesson of the camp, Gilroy's father, Sergeant Robert Gilroy Sr. of the Chicago Police Department, conducted his own investigation of the disappearance of his son. Sergeant Gilroy lived four blocks north of Gacy's house at the Pavilion Apartments on Northeast River Road. Sergeant Gilroy called the Blue Ribbon Riding Center on September 27th after discovering that his son had left his riding gear at home. A spokesman for the Blue Ribbon Riding Center in Northbrook, where Bob was a member, said he had not attended his scheduled lessons for weeks, contrary to what he had told his parents. The doorman of a luxury high-rise apartment building on North Lakeshore Drive may have seen Gilroy in November. The doorman refused to allow Sergeant Gilroy to talk to residents because he didn't want them disturbed. The missing persons report on Robert Gilroy was the longest of all the Gacy victims, with Sergeant Gilroy filing reports daily and then finally agreeing to cut it down to once a week. The report ended up being 42 pages long before being stopped in July of 1978. Bob Gilroy's remains were found buried in the crawl space of Gacy's home and were listed as body number 25. He was identified on January the 6th, 1979, using dental records. He is buried at Mount Carmel Catholic Cemetery at Hillside, Illinois.
17-year-old Rick Lewis Johnston from Bensonville, Illinois, disappeared in August 6, 1976. Rick was the son of Kenneth and Esther Johnson and had two siblings, sister Carrie and brother Greg. His parents were divorced. Rick attended Driscoll Catholic High School and was to start his senior year in the fall of 1976. He was a wrestler in junior high and an avid reader and Tolkien fan. Early each morning, he would run around the golf course. A budding environmentalist and concerned about air pollution, he chose to ride his bike rather than use a car. Rick had gone to a concert featuring the band Spirit at the Aragon Ballroom in Uptown and was last seen by his mother when she dropped him off. He was going to ride his bike, but his mom put a kibosh on that, saying it was too far and too dangerous and she would drive him. Mrs. Johnston had been to the Aragon Ballroom during the big band era and was shocked by the deterioration and condition of the neighborhood. She considered waiting for him and just driving around, but thought it would be safer if she got out of the neighborhood and went home. She thought Rick would be okay inside the concert hall. Rick said that he would probably meet some friends and come home with them. If he didn't get a ride, he would call her or his sister Carrie. By daylight, Mrs. Johnston was worried and called around to his friends, but no dice. By 11 a.m., she called the Bensonville police and called her older son Greg, who came from Galena, Illinois. She called the hospitals. Greg and his sister Carrie went to the Aragon Ballroom to show pictures of their younger sibling. No one recognized him, but they were warned to be careful on the streets as they were in a high crime area. When the Gacy news broke, Rick had been missing for over two years. The Gacy address was near a bus line that Rick would have taken to try to get home. What if he had taken that bus? That led Carrie's visit to 8213 Summerdale and talking to the officer there. He suggested that she turn in his medical records to the sheriff's office. On December 29, 1978, Rick Johnston was found in the crawl space under Gacy's laundry room and was labeled body number 23. The identification was made on New Year's Day from dental records supplied by the family. Rick Johnston is buried in St. Adelbert Catholic Cemetery in Niles, Illinois. Nineteen-year-old John Mowry returned to Chicago in early 1977 after spending 18 months in the Marines. John had joined the Marines after graduating from Anmanson High School. After his military stint was over, he got a job at a bank and started taking accounting classes at Truman College in Uptown. He moved out of the family home and into his own apartment on Cullum with a friend, a guy named Mike. John's mother, Dolores Nieder, last saw her son on September 25, 1977, when he came to dinner at her house on Sunnyside Avenue. He left the house at 10 p.m. and borrowed an umbrella because it had started to rain. The Mowry family was not a stranger to tragedy. Judith Mowry, John's 21-year-old sister, had been stabbed to death in her north side apartment six years prior to her brother's disappearance. John, only 14 years old at the time, discovered her body after he was sent to her apartment to check on her. Judy was a clerk typist for the county assessor's office. On January 27, 1979, body number 20 was identified as John Mowry using dental records that his mother Dolores obtained from the Marines. Gacy had strangled Mowry and buried his body beneath the master bedroom. Doris Nieder filed a wrongful death suit in 1980 against Gacy, the City of Chicago, the Illinois Department of Corrections, and the Iowa State Board of Parole. Nieder alleged that the Chicago Police Department owed a duty of care to her son and that it breached that duty by failing to protect Mowry, by failing to investigate previous missing persons cases leading to her son's death. All counts of the suit, except the count against Gacy, were dismissed. In 2012, attorney Steve Becker and Robert Stevenson took a look at the disappearance of John Mowry. While shown a picture, two friends of Mowry's 
later identified Mike as Michael Rossi, an employee of John Wayne Gacy. Mike had moved into the apartment a week before Mallory's disappearance. The last time the two women heard from Mallory, they had talked to him on the phone, and he told them one of his dogs had been run over by a car. No legal action was ever taken or any police investigation. Michael Rossi has had some run-ins with the law, and Gacy's other employee, David Cram, committed suicide in 2001 by hanging himself from a tree. The disappearance of Rob Peast, victim number 33, was the turning point in the downfall of John Wayne Gacy. Rob was a kid from an intact, nonviolent home, an honor student and athlete who disappeared on his mother's birthday. He went on canoe trips with his dad, the all-American boy, an unlikely runaway. Peast had told his mother that he was going to talk to John Gacy about a job and to wait for him at the pharmacy. The Des Plaines police didn't have to look too hard to connect Peast with Gacy. I covered Peast in the previous video on John Gacy, so I won't rehash it here. After Gacy's arrest, the Chicago Police Department were criticized for not linking the disappearance of more than 30 kids to Gacy sooner than they did. They also came under attack from the parents of a number of victims for the seemingly routine fashion in which the sudden disappearance of their sons were treated. In response to the criticism, investigators ordered all the missing persons files from 1972 until Gacy's arrest. The Records Division turned over more than 45,000 case reports. The Chicago Police Department announced plans to include more pertinent information in its computer files of missing persons so that the common denominators among cases can be ascertained more quickly. John Gacy's defense attorney, Sam Amarante, wrote legislation for a program called iSearch, that required police to immediately begin searches for missing children, dumping the 72-hour waiting requirement. This program was the precursor to the Amber Alert. Attempting to tell the story of all 33 victims would make for a very long video. In addition, some of the information on some of them was very limited. As with many crimes of this type, the perpetrator gets all the publicity and victims become forgotten. These boys and young men came from all walks of life. Some lived on the edge of poverty. Some came from violent and abusive homes. Some were college students. Two were former Marines, and one was married. May they rest in peace.